So like Ross said, I'll be talking about no-brainer and applications of deep learning in neuroimaging. So deep learning is all around us. Uh, deep learning is used in you know, a lot of technologies that we interact with. It's uh, used in self-driving cars so that the cars can understand the environment around them. Uh, it's used in chatbots. Um, it, Facebook has a really powerful face recognition in a deep neural network that they call Deep Face. Zoom uh, is able to transcribe the audio from recorded meetings into text. And uh, I haven't confirmed this, but I'm almost, I'm 90% sure that they're using deep learning for that. Uh, Google Translate is a great tool in part because of deep learning. And uh, assistants like uh, Amazon Alexa, uh, Google Home, Siri, um, they all use deep learning to be able to understand uh, our speech. And healthcare nowadays is, um, becoming more interested in applying deep learning uh, into its own practice. Um, so this is a photo of me in the middle. Uh, and even this photo uh, used deep learning. So this was taken using um, Apple's portrait mode. Uh, so this was with a single lens camera. And uh, they used deep learning to create a depth map and then blur the background. So deep learning is, is really all around us. Let's see. Oh, and uh, I wanted to actually connect this uh, to um, Professor Richard's talk. Uh, if you notice, this is all part of the AI set that he was talking about. These are all tasks that humans do uh, quite well, I would say. Uh, so deep learning is particularly well suited for imaging. And there are three uh, main types of problems you can tackle uh, in imaging with deep learning. So one is classification. This is taking some input and mapping it to some class. So for example, with the dog on the right side, uh, classification might be, you know, what breed is this dog? Or what is this an image of? Uh, another problem is uh, segmentation. And this is classifying every single pixel. So this, this you know, question might be, uh, fill in the space occupied by the dog, or fill in the space of the dog's uh, nose. Uh, and you can also, um, th there's a third class uh, that would be regression. And that's when you're mapping the features to some continuous variable. So for example, how much does the dog weigh or how old is the dog? These are all continuous things. And, you know, a lot of us are familiar with deep learning now, uh, at least the term, uh, and its popularity really exploded uh, back in 2011. Um, and this was mostly due to improvements in hardware and the availability of data. As Professor Richards said, uh, these models take you know, lots of data to, to train. Um, but the theory for, for these things has been around since the mid 20th century. So deep learning and neuroimaging. There are you know, lots of, lots of you know, uh, places for deep learning uh, in neuroimaging. Uh, one is brain extraction, which you see on the top left. That's a segmentation problem, uh, figuring out where the brain is in space. Uh, on the right uh, is a parcellation or segmentation of the brain, another uh, problem that you might solve with deep learning. Um, even something like registration, uh, which is aligning a brain to some template. And to do this, you know, there are an abundance of frameworks. Uh, there's TensorFlow, uh, Keras, uh, PyTorch, MixNet, CNTK, Chainer, and probably many more. And you know, probably someone's working on a new one right now. And a lot of them have great built-in support for working with 2D images because it's such a common problem, especially in industry. Um, but uh, I haven't seen one with great built-in support for 3D images like we have in, in brain imaging. So this is where NoBrainer comes in. This is a project, uh, open source project uh, on GitHub. Um, and it's a framework for developing neural network models for 3D image processing. And it provides methods to convert data to deep learning framework friendly formats. 
Uh, it provides data augmentation methods, which can make your models uh, more generalizable and perhaps less prone to overfitting. Uh, it implements several architectures, loss functions, and metrics from the literature. And it has a gallery of examples for processing data and training models. And I think one of the really special features about NoBrainer is that uh, we include fully trained models for 3D segmentation. And we're trying to you know, uh, produce more models uh, as time goes on. Um, and I think this is really special because lots of pre-trained models exist for uh, 2D problems like segmentation and uh, classification. Um, but I really haven't seen any for uh, 3D segmentation. And it's built on top of TensorFlow and Keras. Uh, so we can use all of the cool features that, that TensorFlow uh, affords and also the um, ease of the Keras API. So this is one of the models that uh, we distribute with uh, NoBrainer. This is a, this is actually a special network in, in that it's a Bayesian network. So uh, I, I won't really get into that, but um, what I will say is that in the middle, you have the predictions from the model, and this is used to uh, create a segmentation of the brain. Um, similar to free surfers recon all and it's it's more accurately a subset of free surfers recon all um, so the reference values are in the free surfer column and the inputs are uh, the structural uh, scans and you can see that the predictions are quite similar to the free surfer scans um, but uh, the major advantage here is that the predictions take on the order of seconds if you have a gpu and if you, if you have a cpu only then it's on the order of minutes maybe five minutes, um, whereas free server takes several hours to do the same thing. Of course, recon all does much more than just segmentation, but um, I think the point still stands. So uh, this is on GitHub. It was trained on over 20,000 brains uh, by our collaborators at the National Institute uh, for Mental Health, and it was published recently. Uh, so you can go online uh, for the manuscript. And we also, I think you guys learned about uh, containerization, uh, might be a new term to, to many of you, uh, but we distribute a uh, Docker container and a Singularity container um, so that you can use this on your own data. But just keep in mind that it is experimental. Uh, another model that we distribute is a brain extraction model. So um, this is you know, another segmentation model uh, that's finding the brain in space. And the inputs here, uh, these are two different scans. The rows are two different scans. The inputs are the T1 weighted images. Uh, and you can see that the model prediction overlaps quite well with the free server brain mask. If you look on the bottom row, uh, the scan had uh, some motion. And you can see that because the brain has these uh, striations. It looks a bit more like an onion. And it doesn't actually look like that. That's a motion artifact. Um, so free surfer, uh, for some reason, uh, failed. Uh, on this segmentation, uh, it missed a lot of the brain, but the model um, did decently well. Uh, it, it overshot a little bit and it was a bit conservative in other areas, but um, it did decently. <laughs> and so we also, oops, we also uh, have this model online. Uh, this was trained on 10,000 human weighted scans and uh, towards the end of Professor Richard's talk, uh, he talked about transfer learning, starting off with, you know, uh, uh, I guess, other data or like a pre-trained model. This model might be a great starting point for transfer learning. Uh, and 10,000 brain scans, I think even, you know, that might not even be enough to have like a truly generalizable model, but I also think it's a great start. So um, another model that uh, we use uh, or that we distribute is a model that labels uh, brain tumors, in this case meningiomas, which are the most common um, non-malignant neoplasm in the brain. Uh, so um, here we have uh, T1-weighted contrast-enhanced images, uh, an expert label, and the expert in this case was a radiologist or a neurosurgeon. And then um, on the right, we have the model's prediction. And you can see that the model does quite well. Um, and it even has a, a smoother uh, prediction than, than the expert label. Um, and this scan is the same person's scan, both rows. It's just that they have two tumors. 
And you can see that the model is able to detect both, both uh, tumors. Um, and so this model is also online uh, under the Neuronets um, namespace. This used transfer learning actually from that brain extraction model that I showed you. And so this, I think, is a great example of the power and utility of transfer learning, because here we didn't have that many samples. We had maybe uh, 500 or 600 MRIs, and we were still able to, to produce, uh, I think, great outputs. And we're in the process of publishing this model now. And I don't know if Professor Richards talked about um, uh, specific architectures, but uh, the brain extraction model and the meningioma model are 3D units. Uh, this is a common model. This, this came out in 2016. Uh, and that first uh, segmentation network that I showed you that is based on MeshNet. So, you know, you might be wondering, how can I do this? Uh, I've seen a lot about deep learning, the power, the, the drawbacks. Uh, how can I actually get down into it? So there's, you know, a, a pretty standard workflow that at least I follow. Um, I would say that most people would follow this. Um, step zero, consider whether deep learning is the right tool for the job. This is very important. Um, deep learning is definitely not always the right tool, but uh, when it is, it can be very powerful. Uh, so then step one, uh, get data. You need to have, this is typically a supervised process, so you need to have features and you need to have the corresponding labels, the, the reference. Uh, then you create some processing pipeline where you standardize your data, maybe you augment your data. Uh, basically, that's where you sort of manipulate your features uh, and maybe your labels. Uh, you choose a loss function, which is the objective that your model is trying to minimize over time. Uh, then uh, you can choose a model. So there are lots of different architectures. Uh, and you have to you know, implement it or at least find some implementation online. And uh, a good way, a good heuristic for choosing a model, I think, uh, is to look at you know, the various segmentation or classification, whatever problem you're working on. Uh, look at you know, competitions uh, that happened recently in those fields and see what models worked well. Um, then you train the model on some data, you evaluate the model on other data uh, and then you repeat that process over and over again uh, until you have uh, something good. So, you know, this is the end of uh, the slideshow. I'd like to thank uh, several people, uh, particularly Satra Ghosh, who was uh, my PI at MIT, uh, the Gabrielli Lab at MIT, our collaborators at the National Institute for Mental Health. Um, they taught me a lot about deep learning. Uh, our collaborators at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and uh, all of those who contributed to No Brainer, and also Stony Brook University uh, School of Medicine for having me now. Uh, and also thank you Brain Hack School for the opportunity to share my work with all of you. Uh, so, um, I have the links here to the Cole Evan Bind Notebook. I, Ross, I got those from the email that you sent to me. Um, I'm, you know, hopefully they're the same. So um, we have a couple of questions. I don't know, Russ, if yes. you're ready to answer questions, but maybe that's a good time for like uh, having any question on the uh, on the introduction to your practical. Yeah, um, I'd love to take some questions. Absolutely. Right. So uh, one of them is uh, the last one I see is what about segmentation for brain with re uh, re what was that? Uh, sorry. Re resections. I'm guessing. Resection. Oh yeah, resection. Yeah. Uh, first of all, SPM usually cannot handle these um, since they are designed for normal brains. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. And actually, this is something that I, I um, ran into problems with with the meningioma model because sometimes the tumors were very close to the to the edges of the brain, um, and so brain extraction just simply wouldn't work. Um, you know, I don't think I have a good answer. Uh, what I will say though is that uh, these models don't typically generalize well. So they will be good at the task that they were trained for, but they won't magically be good on you know, data that they just have not seen. So if you train on, on brains that have no resections, uh, and then you predict on brains with resections, I predict that it, it, it won't work well. So either you'll have to augment 
or you have to find brains with resections. Thank you for that. And we have another question. Uh, is the input data manually quality controlled for segmentation accuracy? Another good question. So um, it depends on the uh, amount of data I think that you have. So in the meningioma case, yes, every single scan was quality controlled. And actually they were quality controlled several times throughout you know, the process. Uh, with the free surfer um, like uh, predictions, um, we couldn't manually quality control all of them. Uh, because in the smaller model, we had 10,000 brains. In the larger model, we had over 20,000 brains. So um, manually, no, we did not. But um, I believe our collaborators at NIMH uh, had some sort of programmatic way to, to sort of do at least like a cursory quality control. Uh, and actually, um, there's, there's some research going on now in using deep nets for quality control of of brains as well. So, um, you know, that, that's just another output for this. Uh, so the answer to your question is sometimes. Thank you. And I think that's, uh, those are the two questions that are at least uh, prominent in the chat. Okay. Uh, so maybe that's a yeah, good time to uh, go on with the, uh, the practicals would be like a, oh. another layer. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay, let's do it. So I'll open the call up notebook. I actually, I should have opened this earlier. I'm sorry, but. Okay, um, but it seems to be running. So uh, can people see uh, my notebook right now? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, should I wait at all uh, for people to open this up? Um, hopefully people have opened it up. We posted the links okay. in, the, uh, right. in the chat earlier. Um, and so if anyone hasn't opened it up or if anyone's having trouble getting the collab or binder to, to run, um, mm -hmm. please do let us know uh, mm -hmm. in the chat and we will we'll kind of take those. So I think Jacob, you can just kind of run through um, yeah. as you'd like. Okay, excellent. Um, so the first thing for those on Colab, only for those people on Colab, um, we want to use a GPU. So in runtime, uh, change runtime type, and then we're going to select a GPU hardware accelerator and uh, save. Um, don't select TPU because I have not tested the code on TPU. Um, so select GPU, please. Okay, and save. And so now we have access to a GPU. So this will basically like accelerate all of our uh, model functions. Uh, so, okay, so let's get started. Um, so this notebook will uh, have lots of breadth and some depth. So my goal here is to expose you to lots of different concepts and I guess give you pointers of where you can find more information, but to give you, you know, some solid uh, foundation at least. Um, and, you know, if you ever come across any issues or ways to improve no uh please do submit an issue or pull request. We really appreciate when people uh, uh, give us feedback on this. Um, and uh, NoBrainer has uh, example notebooks um, on his GitHub. This notebook is different in that uh, I tailored it more to you know, the brain hack and uh, combined a lot of different concepts into one notebook. OK, so we will here, uh, we will uh, learn how to visualize MRI prior to model training. So I think this goes back to the question of um, manual uh, quality control it's very important to at least understand the data that you're dealing with. Um, visualize your features, visualize your labels. Um, and uh, two, we'll learn how to process features for model training. Three, we will be training a brain extraction model, a very simple one. Um, we'll use a pre-trained no-brainer model for brain extraction. 
and another no-brainer model for multi-class segmentation. And those are two of the models that I described uh, in the slides. Um, and then uh, we'll understand parts of uh, a real world deep learning workflow. So, you know, what one would do if they've accessed lots of data um, and wanted to train, to train a model. And so finally, we'll use no brainer to construct that workflow and train a brain extraction model using transfer learning. Sorry, I have a private question. Like uh, if someone hasn't seen why, where to put the uh, CPU, GPU thing, can you just- ah, ah, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So if you're on Colab, so this does not apply to people on Binder. This is only for Colab folks. So go to runtime, uh, change runtime type, and then select the GPU hardware accelerator. And for those on Binder, uh, you won't have a GPU, um, but that's totally fine. Um, I'll let you know the parts that do require, well, not really require a GPU, just go much faster with a GPU. Uh, and I included the outputs from those cells uh, so that you can see what happened anyway. Okay, um, and I explained that here. Uh, some wisdom, uh, <laughs> some bits of wisdom, garbage in, garbage out. So your model will only be as good as your uh, data that you train from. So, you know, you just, you can't just create like a magically amazing model uh, if you don't have good data. Uh, deep learning is not a hammer. It is not always the right tool for the job. Uh, I think that point has been hammered into you guys. <laughs> um, and yes, a hammer is always the right tool for the job. <laughs> uh, also be patient. Uh, so this is a pretty steep learning curve, especially in brain hack. Uh, I saw, you know, earlier in the week, um, I looked at the schedule, you guys were learning about um, Bash and other things, and now you're going on to deep learning. So I, I couldn't really imagine a steeper learning curve. So uh, kudos to all of you. Uh, and also um, be collaborative. Uh, that's really important in the open source community. If you find ways to improve NoBrainer, please submit an issue or a pull request, uh, you know, so that you can, you can let us know. Uh, this is just some info about Google Colab and Jupyter Notebook. Um, so now it's time to begin. Um, first, we'll need to install uh, NoBrainer. So please uh, run this command here, the pip install command. Uh, this will install TensorFlow and uh, NoBrainer, and you'll see that it's using the GitHub URL because I want everyone to um, use the same exact commit of no-brainer. Uh, and here, you know, the first time you run this, you're gonna get a message that says this notebook was not authored by Google. It was not, it was authored by me. Uh, and you know, I'll tell you that it's safe to run, so run anyway. And TensorFlow is already installed in the, in the notebook. Uh oh Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, put an ex uh, exclamation point before that. So it's running like a shell command. Okay, and you'll see that uh, TensorFlow is already installed and all those requirements are already installed. So it's just installing no brainer. And this is the command again. So I'll keep going, but you know, uh, to the TAs and, and the people helping out with this, uh, let me know if, if people in the chat say I'm going too fast or too slow or anything. Uh, so uh, now we import no brainer and hopefully that works. Excellent, that works. So step one complete. We installed no brainer and we imported it. That is awesome. So uh, no brainer is a Python package and uh, it has several different um, modules within it. Um, I won't go through all of these, but uh, I tried to basically separate out functionality in a, in a logical way. Um, we'll be using functionality in the models uh, module, uh, TF records. Actually, we'll be covering a bunch of these. So uh, let's move on. So the first step is to get some data. So NoBrainer includes uh, a function to download some test data, and this comes from um, uh, this data set here, I guess from NIH, uh, but it's packaged by data lab. 
Can we have a quick uh, raise of hand for all those people who uh, went up to the uh, uh, import no-brainer, just making sure that uh, people are on board? Uh, so, how do we run the first command? Ah, uh, Isabel. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I didn't explain that uh, better. So, um, this is how you do it. So, I should have included this. This was a, a bit of an afterthought, I think, for me. So, copy and paste this Python uh, install command, and then. If you hover over here, you'll get a, a button that says add a code cell and then add an exclamation point, which basically runs this as like a shell command instead of a Python command, copy it, and then run that cell. And that will, that will execute that um, as if it was running in bash because of the exclamation point. Is anyone having trouble with that bit? Ah, yes, the exclamation part is important, yes. Um, yeah, in Jupyter Notebook, you can, uh, you can, if you use the exclamation mark, then um, it's going to run that command as if it were uh, a bash command. Uh, module now found. Um, did you install? Oh yeah, which module? Yes. Okay. Um, Kat, did you install uh, using that Python pip install command? Or Kat, sorry. I think what may happen is that you know this, uh, those comments all need to be uh, prefixed by a, a, a scratch exclamation mark. I'm not sure everyone has uh, seen that uh, fully. Yeah. And the reason is that you know uh, this is a, a Python notebook. Uh, so the kernel is in Python, and you want to uh, this exclamation exclamation mark is telling uh, is telling the, the kernel say hey use bash uh, for running those comments. Yes, of course. Okay, so I'll show how to run the command once more. I really should have in included this inside the notebook. I'm very sorry, uh, but I promise this is the only place where you'll have to add a code cell. So, um, you know, if so, first uh, there are two ways. So first, if you hover between two cells, you'll see you can add a code cell. So I'm moving my mouse. Uh, you can add a code cell. And then uh, you need to copy and paste that command, that Python pip install command here. But you need to preface it with an exclamation uh, mark, which means uh, run it in bash. Okay. And uh, we have uh, seen all those uh, pip install commands in the in the during the week, so I think it's uh, it's a nice little uh, you know sort of like, uh, exercise and uh, making sure that the uh, this is uh, uh, you 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 master those uh, little uh, steps that are critically important. Uh, the uh, maybe uh, Jakob, you could tell us where is this command running? Uh, where ah oh uh, so. If I understand your question correctly, uh, this command is not running on your own computer. It's not running in your browser per se. Uh, this is running on someone else's server, basically. Uh, in the case of Colab, uh, I guess it's Google servers. Um, uh, and JB, if you want to like correct me uh, or, or or add to that, please do so. Uh, in the case of um, uh, Binder. Um, uh, I guess, I don't know whose servers those are, um, but they might be donated or something. I'm not sure. But basically, it's someone else's servers, so you don't have to install these things yourself. 
Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, in case of Binder, this is like a, a, some, uh, some of Berkeley resources, some I think mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of uh, companies that also have a uh, chiming to give uh, Binder some resources. But uh, obviously, uh, Google has maybe more resources. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, I should say for the record that you know uh, Google Collab is maybe like a great tool. It's just been entirely stolen from uh, the Jupiter Fault. Uh, yes. And it, uh, yes. <laughs> it, is, it is a bit of a sad story where like a big company takes uh, an open source uh, project uh, and doesn't contribute back, uh, just uh, make it uh, its own for its uh, own purpose and uh, and benefit. Uh, anyways, yeah. we use the tool because it's useful, but uh, we are aware of this uh, this little story. Of course. Um... Uh, oh, uh, okay, so about the you're not utilizing the GPU, uh, don't worry about that for now, uh, because I think it's just that we are a bit idle for now, but we will use the GPU. So, um, so I guess I, I do want to move on. So the last time for this pip install command, uh, you have to add a code cell and then, um, include, you know, uh, include a exclamation point and then include that pip install command. Don't run the conda uh, command. I just included that for, I don't know, people, uh, if they were curious, don't do that. Uh, I should have known not to include it, <laughs> but that's all right. So anyway, now we move on, uh, we get the data. This is simply just uh, run the cell, shift enter. And so this, um, this uh, downloads data for us um from data lad uh, i don't know if you guys learned about data lad but um no we haven't uh, the uh, schedule was already quite packed but uh, yeah. it's, uh, if you want to say one word on it that's fine uh, um how can i oh, oh no, explain oh, it? No. let's let's go let's, yeah. let me, let's move on. Like, i'm gonna move on so this downloaded data uh, these are MGZ files, and these are the uh, you know where they um, exist uh, on the server in this case. So uh, these are all MGZ files. So these are MGH uh, format files. Um, these are our features, and these are our labels. The labels are um, APARC ASEG files. So those are outputs from Reconol. So the first thing you want to do is, you know, understand this data, visualize it, uh, try to understand what it looks like. So we import NumPy. Um, and by the way, to run these cells, uh, you know, you can click on the cell to activate it and then press shift enter, or you can press this uh, button here. So we import NumPy and I included this line here to uh, print the full flow values uh, so that you can uh, see what they are so that it's not scientific notation. Um, okay, so first, uh, not first anymore, uh, we're well into the notebook. So we read uh, the volume. Uh, no brainer includes, you know, methods to read the volume. This is uh, a very simple wrapper over a um, package called NiBabel, which is very powerful and uh, includes lots of methods for, you know, dealing with neuroimaging files. Uh, so we read that. What we're doing here is reading uh, in the first row of files the feature volume and the label volume. And now we'll get to explore those. So first, uh, so X and Y are now NumPy arrays. Um, so let's look at the shape of the array. So the shape is 256. 256, 256. So that means that it's uh, you know, a three-dimensional uh, cube in this case. And FreeCipher for some reason likes uh, that shape, 256, 256, 256. Uh, and the segmentation volume is the same shape. So that's great because um, you know, they, they overlap well. Well, I can't really say that yet, but I mean their shape is the same and that's probably a good sign. Oh, someone had file paths is not defined. Um, I think uh, you maybe forgot to run uh, the previous cells. So running these cells, um, you have to run them in order because uh, some of the variables are defined in previous cells. 
So, you know, if you're getting undefined errors, uh, you know, go up a few cells and, and rerun things because they should run quickly. Um, so, you know, I can do that too. Uh, get data, I'm rerunning that. Uh, understand your data, import NumPy, read the files, get the shape. Okay, and now let's get the minimum and maximum of the features. So here we see that it's zero and 255. Um, that's because, um, well, we don't really have to get into that, but that's because of the data type. Um, it's an unsigned 8-bit integer, and those are the bounds. And so free server filled it to the bounds. So for y, the minimum and maximum are 0 and 2035. Um, so that's great. Now we might wonder, you know, what are the unique values of y? What are the unique segmentation values? So we can use uh, numpy's unique function here. And so these are all of the unique values within the label that we loaded. Um, so they go from 0 to 235, as we saw, but it doesn't include all of the values between that. Another thing that you can see is that these are all integers. Um, and that's because these all represent uh, classes. And so FreeSuffer maps these values to some, you know, like human recognizable uh, name. Uh, but we don't have to worry about those names right now. We're just really concerned about um, having the values, really. So now uh, we want to uh, plot the data so we can visualize it. And we can use matplotlib for that. Um, have, have, have you guys taught matplotlib at all? Um, we had yes. Uh, yes, we had some uh, like a, a lessons on visualization uh, where uh, some of those tools were introduced briefly. So like uh, you yeah, know, like yeah. feel free to like uh, uh, so like uh, you know, it's to me uh, it is important that there is some little bit of a repetition so that people can, people yeah. can invest uh, deeply. So uh, so feel free feel free to uh, 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 repeat whenever you feel uh, is necessary. Okay, excellent. Um, so matplotlib is. Um, probably the most popular uh, plotting library for Python. Um, so we will import it here. Uh, so that should work for everyone. And now uh, we're going to use matplotlib to plot a histogram. Uh, and we'll plot a histogram of the features, uh, that's x here. Uh, but uh, the histogram function expects a one-dimensional array. And so we know that our features and labels are both three-dimensional. So we need to flatten it into one dimension. Uh, and that's fine for the histogram because we're only concerned about the values and not necessarily their shape. So here we get a histogram. And you can see that you know, the majority of values are close to 0. And that's because most of the brain scan is, well, maybe not most, but a lot of the brain scan is, in fact, background. Um, the, the head only takes up, you know, so much of the actual skin. So zero is black, and um, so the darker bits are, are closer to zero. Um, oh, I guess there were two calls to this. That's fine. So you can run it again. <laughs> That's repetition. Um, now let's uh, plot a histogram of the labels. So this isn't plotting necessarily all of the individual labels and their, their uh, value counts, but uh, you can see that you know, the vast majority are close-ish to zero. But you know, now we want to inspect what are the actual unique values and, and how many are there. So you know, we can run this command here. Uh, oops, let me go back up a bit. So I can unpack this command a little bit. Um, we're using the uh, numpy unique function again on the labels here. Um, and we're telling the unique function that we also wanted to return the counts, the number of times that each unique value appears in the array. So that returns uh, two things, the unique values and their counts. And now uh, this is just for visualization. I'm um, using NumPy's uh, stack function, which stacks arrays. I'm stacking them side by side so that we can uh, visualize easily how many values there are 
or sorry, how many times each value appears in uh, the label. So you can see that zero appears by far, you know, the most. Um, and that's because zero is background uh, or yeah, background. Um, and you can find uh, online uh, free surfers mapping. Uh, it's called free surfer uh, color lookup table, L-U-T. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can, you can look through this and see exactly how many times each label appears. Um, so this doesn't, I mean, this tells us a lot, but, uh, you know, at least we know that the, ma the vast majority is background and we have, you know, a bunch of, of other classes as well. So now we want to plot uh, these scans so we can actually visualize what the scans look like. So let's expand uh, the plotting scan, uh, the plot scan section. Uh, Google Colab um, collapses cells in different sections. So just expand those when you see that. All right, so let's try to plot our features. So matplotlib includes a mat show function, which you can use to plot a uh, matrix. Um, so let's run that on our features. Okay, so what happened? We got an error, a type error. Invalid shape, uh, 256, 256, 256 for image data. Why did this happen? So it happened because, um, this expects a uh, a uh, either a two D array or a three D array that is like an image. So an image is a is technically a three D array um, where the last dimension has either three or four channels R G B or R G B plus opacity or some other color uh, um, uh, whatever. Um, in this case. This is not an image uh, that matplotlib can plot. So we need to plot by slice. So we know that our uh, array is three dimensions. So we can index uh, in the first dimension, get slice 120. So that's close to the middle of the brain, not exactly the middle. Um, so let's inspect that shape. All right, so now we have a shape 256 by 256. This is something Matt show uh, can work with. So um, this plotting functionality here might be uh, a bit advanced, but um, it's still you know, confusing to me uh, sometimes. So I always need to look up you know, how do I plot multiple uh, things in, in the same figure. Uh, so don't worry, it, it does get easier, but um, you know, I, I still need help with this stuff sometimes. Anyway, uh, let's run this cell. Uh, you'll see what comes up. So we're plotting three different slices. Uh, and we have uh, one row and three columns of, 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 of images. Uh, so here, I'm highlighting right now, that is, uh, in the case of this image, the sagittal plane. Uh, the first dimension lets you uh, index uh, sagittal plane um, slices. The second dimension, axial plane or transverse. And the third dimension, coronal. So you need to, to recognize that this is not uh, always going to be the case. It won't always be that the first dimension is sagittal and the last dimension is coronal. Um, so you really need to, to visualize your data and see, you know, what is the orientation and, and, and which, you know, slices are, are, are where and so on. Um, so great, and now we see our brain. Uh, it's in the middle, um, good contrast. Uh, let's move on. Now we're plotting our, uh, oh, sorry, does the fact that, sorry, I'm looking at the, so Kendra asked, uh, sorry, a while uh, ago, five minutes ago, uh, does the fact that the X values go up to 255 have to do with how there's 255 degrees in RGB? Uh, it's related but not exactly. Um, I think RGB also uses unsigned or, or like, yeah, uh, also uses unsigned 8-bit integers. Uh, that's my guess. And the similarity is that this volume also was in unsigned 8-bit integer uh, 
uh, type. Uh, so that's the real reason. Um, but you're right that it is similar to RGB images. Um, yeah, I think JPEG does that. Maybe PNG, I'm not sure. All right, so let's move on. Uh, we're plotting our labels now. So we have, you know, now instead of uh, X, we have Y because those are our labels. And we're indexing sagittal, axial, and chronal. So I'm running that with Shift Enter. And uh, you can see, um, you know, some of the labels. Uh, so you can see that, you know, they overlap uh, quite well with, um, uh, with the brain uh, up top. And so this isn't plotting absolutely all of the labels, um, but many of them. So let's move on. Um, so, you know, you, you need to consider what problem you're kind of trying to solve. So in this case, we're trying to make a brain mask. So we have all these different labels, but what we really want is a mask of the brain. So what we can do here is binarize. So what we're saying is collapse all of the labels greater than zero and make them all one. So in the end, we're getting a label volume that is all zeros or ones. Zero corresponds to background, or I should say not brain, and one corresponds to brain. So if we do that with this, so y is a numpy array. Uh, y greater than zero um, is basically uh, uh, performing um, that operation on every single value. So you get a, uh, an array full of true or falses with the same shape as y. And uh, what this is doing is saying, wherever y is greater than zero, set that value to one. So we run that. And now let's plot the features once again. Aha. So now we see a pretty nice brain mask. Um, there's something going on here with the cerebellum, but we won't worry about that. Um, that's out of the scope of this uh, workshop, I think. <laughs> um, I don't know what happened there also. So, OK. Great. Uh, let me just look at the chat just to see. OK, excellent. Nothing going on. Great. All right, so now let's check the overlap. So we're checking um, to see whether our uh, brain mask overlaps well with the actual brain in the scan. Because if it doesn't, then our model will learn that, but it's not what we want the model to learn. So as Professor uh, Richards said, uh, you can always overfit your model. Um, the model will try to learn something because it doesn't know what it's seeing. Um, it just is trying to minimize its loss. So any way that it can minimize its loss function, uh, it, will, it will do that basically. So uh, we need to be very careful that our features are, are correct. Oh, sorry, that our labels are correct. Um, so here, uh, the colors are a little bit weird. Um, that's just uh, a quirk that, you know, I could have done this in a more advanced way, but I thought this was fine. So I left it this way. The brain mask is purple. You can see we're plotting with purples, uh, the color map purples, uh, and alpha of 0.2. That's why you get this gray bit on the outside because it's trying to like make the black a little more uh, transparent but it makes it a bit gray. So anyway, uh, you can see that the brain mask uh, overlaps with the brain uh, quite well. Okay, so, you know, we're looking good. Next, uh, after we uh, have, you know, inspected our data, we want to process it in some way. Uh, this is an important step. Uh, so there are a few things we're going to do. One is standardize our features. Um, and in this case, what that means is z-score them. So we're going to transform our features, which were originally 0 to 255, and transform them to have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Um, 
there are other things you could do. Uh, a typical uh, pre-processing step done with um, images, like 2D images, is uh, transforming from a range of 0 to 1. Transforming to a range of 0 to 1. So basically, you just divide by 255 in most cases. Or transforming to a range of negative 1 to 1. So Jakob, maybe it's worth uh, you know, explain why why would that this step is important and uh, when would you take it versus not? Uh, is, is there like a bit of a uh, uh, explanation on the on why we're doing this? Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll be honest, JP. I don't know like the 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 theoretical uh, like reason for why. Uh, in practice, I've seen that if if I don't do this, then then the model does not learn well. Um, another uh, practical reason is that um, uh, if you train the model, you know, in in basically, it's so that you every time you run data through the model, then uh, the input has like a similar, I guess, like feature it's 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 all within like a similar range or something yep. uh so then the model the model is used to that basically so that you train and predict using the same standardization but i mean do you do you know like the the there must be a theoretical reason i just don't know it i'm, I'm sorry uh i mean I, I i can think of one reason but uh you know like it might not be the uh only one or the even the most uh, uh, important one i think i think like uh, numerically speaking if we're starting with like a, a, a ranges of values that are a little bit uh, misbehaving or very large. So, so it's, it's possible, it's probable that, you know, you want to uh, keep your values as a, you know, in a, in a kind of a normal range, uh, because that numerically speaking, you're going to be uh, better off. Uh, uh, in, yeah. But uh, there may be other reasons and clearly the, you know, reapplying the same things on, on similar things is, is definitely one of them as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone asked in the chat, the mean and the standard deviation are calculated on the whole sample or on each individuals? Um, uh, so uh, in this case, it is on the uh, whole sample here. Um, you can do it on individuals. Uh, let's see, is there a more correct way? I'm not sure which one you might want to choose. Um, you'd probably want to choose on like each batch or each uh, individual sample rather than the entire thing um, because the model isn't seeing all of the data at once. Uh, and when using a pre-trained model, should we standardize the data in the same way as the pre-trained data? Absolutely. Um, if you don't, then uh, your model will most likely not give you the output you're expecting. So you absolutely need to process in the exact same way. So uh, if you're standardizing, so, okay, let's move on. Uh, so this function basically implements uh, z-scoring. Um, and so we did that. And now let's inspect our mean and standard deviation of this one feature. So this is an important point, I think. Uh, you'll see that the mean is some value to the negative 17th. Uh, sorry, times 10 to the negative 17th. That's a very small number. It's basically zero. But um, in a computer, for some reason, you just can't accurately represent, like with 100% uh, accuracy, um, decimal values. Uh, at least not using like the, the float types. So they're close, but not e e exactly, you know, uh, those values. The next thing that we need to do is, you know, we have our 3D volume, but with, you know, most GPUs out there, other than, you know, the highest end GPUs, uh, there's not enough memory to train a model on the entire 3D uh, scan. So what we do is separate that scan into uh, blocks, basically. So if we have a 256 uh, scan, 256 on each side, then if we separate it into blocks of 128, non-overlapping blocks, 
then uh, we get eight blocks. Does that make sense? Because uh, if you're imagining like the top of the scan, you have four blocks, the bottom of the scan, you have four blocks. Uh, so um, we can separate it into blocks basically. So let's run that. We choose our block shape to be 128 by 128 by 128. And then no brainer implements uh, that function to take the full scan separate into blocks. And later on, we'll uh, put them back together into the full scan. So here we do that. Uh, we do the same thing with the labels. Remember that uh, you know, your features have to, sorry, your labels have to correspond to your features. So if you're separating the, the features into blocks, you're going to have to separate the labels into blocks. Uh, and each block has to you know, have a correspondence. Meaning that the, like the label block has to correspond to the appropriate feature block. All right, so now we're looking at the shape. Uh, you'll see that we made eight blocks and uh, they're all 128 by 128 by 128. Same thing for the labels. Let me just take a look at the chat if there are any questions. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm also mindful of the time, it's, it's 11.49 now. Uh, so we'll, we'll move on, but uh, we'll see if we need to, to take a break or end or anything. You, you'll get another half an hour from uh, 1 to 1.30. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay. yeah, so don't, don't worry too much. Uh, uh, yeah, factor, factor okay. that in. Okay, excellent. So um, that's our shape of our labels and our features. So um, neural networks expect uh, to have some uh, channel dimension. So we need to add uh, a grayscale channel. Um, and basically, uh, sorry, why is X block shape printing eight by 128 cubed? Uh, no, that's a good question. So yeah, it's the number of blocks, yeah. So, so just to reiterate what we did with this function here, uh, we're taking our, you know, I'm trying to, <laughs> to, have a, uh, to make a cube here. I don't have any cubes around me. Uh, no. Um, we have our cube. And then we're separating it out into eight non-overlapping blocks. And we're doing that because uh, our GPUs don't have enough memory to train on uh, the full volumes. And that's something you know, we're exploring with other hardware now because I think it would be important to, to be able to train on a full volume. So here we're adding a uh, channel dimension. Uh, so basically this is adding just one dimension to the end. Uh, and we can do that to the labels as well to match the, the shape uh, of the inputs. Okay, uh, and this is fine because we have only one class that we're trying to predict, uh, brain or not brain, basically. Uh, if you have multiple classes, then that last dimension uh, would be, uh, you know, the number of classes that you have you'd have to do what, I, what is called uh, one-hot encoding. But I won't uh, get into that now uh, because we won't really be doing that. All right, so this is where we um, start working with the actual model. Um, so we need to think of uh, an input shape. So what shape does the model expect? So the model will expect, you know, if we're separating it out into blocks, the model will expect uh, that block shape and that channel dimension, in this case it's one because it's grayscale. Um, there will also be a batch dimension, um, meaning the batch is how many samples the model sees each iteration, but the batch can change its variable. So uh, we don't have to include it. So here we run this, we create our input shape, and we see that it's 128, 128, 128 uh, by one. Okay, so how do you choose your model? There are so many different models out there, um, even for, for 3D segmentation. Uh, 
So there's lots of freedom. Uh, it's not easy really to create, you know, a new model. Uh, I mean, it is easy. It's just a question of how well it will work. <laughs> um, so what I do typically is uh, refer to the literature and see what has worked in the past. So one common architecture is uh, for medical image segmentation is the unit. And oh, for some reason, the image isn't coming up. Uh, basically, uh, it uses, um, it, it, it looks like a U. That's why it's called a unit. So, you know, you have your inputs here and the way that you uh, put the layers together, it looks like a U. Uh, we don't have to get uh, into specifics of the implementation, but that's where it gets the name. And if you want to look at the implementation, uh, it's uh, within no brainer um, on GitHub. So to instantiate it, ah, uh, sorry, uh, I see a, a good question uh, from David. Uh, I see where we added a dimension for a grayscale channel, but how is that populated with information? Maybe I misunderstand how NP expand dims works. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I hope I explained this uh, well, but because it's only, because the dimension is only, uh, has a size one, then we're not really adding any information. Uh, we're not actually changing the size of the array. Um, it's not like we're adding extra space to the array by adding just uh, a dimension of size one. Um, so I guess, I think this is an important point. So yeah, did you want to say something, JB? Uh, I was going to try to explain that as well. So let's yeah. say imagine, imagine you have like a, a set of three numbers in a, in in an array of a, you know dimension three uh, because that's some three numbers. Uh, then then you can think of it as the first row or the first column of a two dimensional num uh, array. Uh, so you you just now have created a dimension, but you haven't uh, uh, you know added numbers. You just think mm -hmm. of it as the first row or the first column of uh, a, a higher dimensional array. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, so, all right, so let's move on. Uh, so in Google Colab, uh, I guess the images uh, aren't working in, in um, uh, what's it called, in uh, Binder, I think the images should show up. Uh, I think I looked at those and I think they showed up, but who knows. Uh, Anyway, let's move on. So let's instantiate our unit. So um, you can look at the documentation for this, uh, but uh, the important bits are uh, the number of classes and the input shape. So the number of classes is important because that defines the output shape of the model. Um, so if it's one class, um, you're going to have an output shape of, you know, some 3D thing and then uh, and one other dimension of size one. I hope that makes sense, but uh, it, it will become clear as we move on. Uh, and the input shape is important because that um, basically is telling the model, you know, what it expects. So we instantiate that. And if Colab is complaining that you're not utilizing the GPU, we will utilize the GPU very soon in the train the model section. So anyway, uh, we instantiated uh, the unit. Uh, so the type of this object is a TensorFlow Keras model. Keras is, uh, it's, it's an API basically. It, it, it defines like how you can construct layers uh, sorry, how you can construct models, um, how you can like define the, the bits that models are composed of. Um, and so one thing that it, uh, this uh, model gives you, one of its methods is summary. So you can print the summary and then you see these are all different layers and uh, the different shapes associated with it. 
and you'll see that our input shape is here. That is not a 12, that is a 128 that's cut off. Um, I don't know how much you guys have learned about uh, different types of, of, of um, neural network uh, layers, but uh, convolution is, you know, of the typical one that you would use for image processing. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Actually, one more thing I will say uh, is the number of trainable parameters. So when you're training your model, uh, you're modifying every step, every time you go through the model uh, to train it, you're modifying all of these parameters. Uh, and these parameters are basically what allow you to map your inputs, your features, finally to your labels. Um, and you know, as you get bigger models, you get more parameters. So, um, so uh, that's when you need more hardware. Uh, what does the concatenate layer do? Uh, concatenate layer. Uh, let's say you know you have uh, some input at the top. Uh, and then you do something to it here and you do something else to it here, uh, you put them back together with concatenate. And I would also highly recommend uh, the TensorFlow uh, documentation. I think it's really well done. They have lots of, uh, uh, they have lots of examples as well. Um, so, you know, uh, maybe that's one place where Google shines. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, you know, they stole, well, I'm, I'm not going to throw any accusations out there, but, but TensorFlow is an open source um, uh, project, um, so you can inspect all of their source code and, and uh, their Keras implementation as well. All right, so the next thing we need to do is choose uh, the optimizer, um, the loss function, any metrics that we, we might want to uh, compute while we're training, um, and you know other optional things uh, like model saving and things like that. But the main ones are the optimizer, the loss function, and uh, the metrics. So uh, now this is the first time where we have to use TensorFlow because uh, that's where the uh, implementations of the optimizers are. And uh, the optimizers are basically, you know, the, the functions that allow the, the model to actually, um, how do I say this, like, like learn, I guess. Yeah, those are the things that are, are helping the model to like adjust all of those parameters uh, to, fit, to fit your features to your labels or I guess to fit your parameters to your training bit, I should say. Um, the loss function is implemented in NoBrainer uh, using TensorFlow, of course. Um, and this is, we'll just use the dice loss. This is a very common uh, loss for segmentation problems. Uh, and it's basically a measure of uh, overlap. And we'll also use the dice as a metric. So the dice loss here is, so a perfect dice score is perfect overlap, and that's a score of one. Uh, the loss you want to minimize. So we do uh, one minus the dice. So for the loss, a perfect dice is zero. I hope that makes sense. And that's because you want to minimize the loss. The optimizer is trying to minimize uh, the loss value all the time, and it's shifting all the parameters in the model to minimize that loss. Uh, so it has to, the, the better performance, uh, the better your performance, the lower your loss value. But the metric we keep as uh, regular dice, and you, can, you should see the difference. This is nobrainer.metrics.dice, and this is nobrainer.losses.dice. All right, uh, so the time is 12.02 now. Um, let's, let's, I guess what we can do, this training can take a little bit of time on Colab uh, because it's 50, 50 epics. So how about, you know, we let this thing train. It won't take the entire hour, of course, but um, this might be a good time to break. What do you think? 
Yeah, that sounds good. Like uh, we could uh, use the time for the model to train. That sounds like a, yeah. the, uh, an excellent uh, uh, breaking point. Yeah. Uh, 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 oh, and, sorry. And, and you'll get you'll get more time. Uh, you know, in, in the in early afternoon, we will keep a uh, uh, pro like a, a half an hour, or maybe forty minutes, uh, for make sure that you finish uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the tutorial. Okay, okay excellent. Um, well, let me just run the cell and make sure that it's working because Danielle ran the cell and got a an error. Um, it's after the second epoch. Um, I'm not, oh, I got the same error as, as Danielle. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, me as well. Oh, no. Uh, me too. Okay, everyone. Oh, I run over that problem. Okay, interesting. Um, hmm. So in that case, it's it's possible that sorry just to jump in it's yeah, possible that course. you may have you may have missed a, a cell up a little bit further up um, when you were splitting the data into blocks. So if that's the case, kind of maybe jump back up to where the data were split yes. into blocks, and just make sure that you've run all of those cells in order uh, before before you get here. Oh no, I get the same thing. Huh. So some people, for some people it works, for some people it does not. Uh, backward data function launch error. Um, one other thing that could, I don't want to delay your launch, but one, one other thing that could uh, help is, uh, don't, don't do this, I'm going to try uh, first. So I'm going to restart my runtime and basically this is clearing uh, everything that was done. Um, I'm going to rerun cells now. So you don't have to, you don't have to install no brainer because that was already installed. Uh, I'm just going to rerun all these things and see if that helps. <coughs> uh, and it should be quick. Uh, oh. I got type error. I knew that. And uh, for those, uh, like if you want to rerun un until a certain cell, there's uh, in the uh, in the menu, uh, in the runtime menu, you have like uh, the uh, run before. Uh, so, uh, so I think uh, that will run, you know, all the cells before a specific cell. So if you sit on one cell and run that run before, it should rerun everything before that cell. So we'll, hopefully we'll this take, works. We'll take a, 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 few, a few minutes to see if we can debug things. Uh, it seems that for some people it runs, some people it doesn't run. Can I just make sure that this is not those who are using Collab versus those who are using Binder, just to make sure? Ah, yes. So if it doesn't run for you, can you tell us if you're using Binder or Collab? Okay, so people are using Collab. Those, those people have a. Um, I think it it might be, it might be still. I don't know. No, I'm not. I'm not too sure what it is. So sorry. Um, I, I'm not sure either because it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. Right. I'm so rerunning it now. So yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was thinking like uh, we need to have a bit more of the uh, error messages uh, to debug that. Yeah. Um, so mine is running right now. Let's see if it errors. Uh, it should happen soon if it will. Hopefully not, <laughs> but we'll see. Oh, epic. Okay. So it's working for some people, but not all. I don't know why that might be. Um, oh no, so mine is working now. Okay, so here is my solution. Uh, go into runtime, restart your runtime. 
So runtime, restart runtime. What this basically does is it clears all of your variables, it clears the memory and so on, and then rerun uh, the cells up until this model fit. Run this model fit cell. Um, and I think that would be a good time to let it go until lunch. Yep. Perfect, uh, Jacob. Just before we go, we did have we did have a question uh, that I think yeah. maybe would be great to answer just right now, just so that we don't we don't lose it. David had mm -hmm. asked if it turns out that some features relevant to our task or, or whatever straddles two or more blocks, do we prevent mm -hmm. our model from incorporating that feature by dividing our volume into blocks? Uh, sorry, uh, the last part. Of the, can you repeat the last part of that question? Yeah, so if, if some of the features in you know, the data are relevant to your task or whatever you're trying to optimize, do we prevent the model from incorporating those features when we divide our volume into blocks? So if you know, the feature is straddling the blocks and we're separating them. Yeah, uh, no, that's, that's a really good question. So um, in my opinion, you know, the ideal solution would be able to train on full volumes. Uh, as GPU technology gets better, uh, it's more and more possible. Um, but for now, uh, with what we have, um, it, I, I've seen the same thing actually. So, uh, especially with the meningioma segmentation, the tumor segmentation model, if a meningioma, uh, straddled, you know, two blocks, um, then it, the, the segmentation wouldn't really be that great along the edges. So, uh, this is where augmentation can help. So one thing that I was going to show a little bit later, I think, in this notebook is um, no brainer includes uh, random rigid transformations as augmentation. So basically, imagine you know, this is this is your brain, or not your brain, but like this is the brain in a brain scan, uh, and you have like some feature that straddles both uh, blocks. Like let's say I don't know this this <laughs> gyrus, let's say um, the augmentation can be such that you like rotate and 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 uh, I think it's mostly yeah rotate reflect uh, and translate the brain in space so that you know your feature is not always straddling the block so it'll sometimes be only in one block sometimes it'll straddle sometimes uh, it'll be upside down or whatever this can really help the model um, like I won't say understand but actually like uh, create some representation of, of, of that feature that's useful. Uh, and hopefully then um, it, hopefully then like even if it straddles the block, it will do better. I hope that answered your question. I hope I didn't confuse you. No, I, th I think that's good for now, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I, think, I think now we should, we should break for lunch if we can, you know, uh, it's 1210, so if, Jacob, if you are still around at one and you're, you're willing to kind of come back to finish this, the notebook, that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course. Great. I'll, and then, I'll have lunch uh, myself. Yeah, perfect. And then for <laughs> those of you who are having issues, um, you know, we, we can try and debug over lunch here and there. Uh, and, you know, there's some randomness in the training, so, so you'll get that. Uh, but in general, we have a decent loss. Uh, we have a different, uh, a decent, a decent um, dice score and a decent loss. Uh, so, you know, let's try this out on a new scan. So uh, we're using our trained model and now we're loading uh, a new scan. So this is in the second row of that file path. So the, uh, of the, sorry, of the features and labels. So this is a second participant, different from the first. Uh, and this was a question earlier. This is a, a, an extremely important point. You need to pre-process your uh, features in the exact same way. Um, so we standardize, uh, we separate into blocks and we expand the dimensions, uh, basically adding that grayscale channel, which does not actually add data. It's just adding another dimension of one. Uh, okay. And now we predict. So we're running, uh, these test blocks through the model and we do that with model dot predict. And uh, I remember someone during uh, Professor Richard's talk asked, you know, how can I, you know, I might have, you know, a GPU or, or great hardware for training. Uh, what if I want to predict on, you know, like in real time? Prediction takes much less uh, power and like resources than training. 
Um, and that's because you're not doing any back, back propagation, you're not updating any weights, you're just running a forward pass. So this is all just a, a lot of um, matrix multiplications, uh, basically. Uh, so, okay, so we predicted, and you'll see that it was one second per step. So each block, it took one second to predict, approximately, because the total was nine seconds. So it's a little higher than that. Uh, our shape now is eight blocks uh, of 128 by 128 by 128, and one uh, channel at the end. Um, do we need to standardize with the same standardized parameters? Uh, we used in the training set. Uh, standardize, uh, what I mean by that is that um, basically if you z-scored your data in the beginning, in the training set, you z-score your data in the test set. That's what I'm saying here. So that the distribution is, is always, you know, it's mean zero and, and standard deviation of one. It's not really a normal distribution, uh, but that seems to be okay. So um, the outputs are probabilities. Uh, so the model will, uh, but you don't use the standard deviation from the training set. Um, maybe we can talk offline about that. Uh, or perhaps someone else can uh, help. Uh, so the outputs are probabilities. They are in the range uh, from zero to one. Um, and so we can apply a threshold. It doesn't have to be 50%. Um, in the literature I've seen, you know, it can be 30%. You can make it whatever you want, honestly. Um, whatever seems to work, I guess. Uh, so here we'll apply a threshold of 50%. So if it's greater than 50%, we call that brain. And otherwise it will be uh, not brain or background. So we can do that here. This will create a Boolean array. So all the values are true or false. Um, and now we've removed that last dimension uh, with squeeze. So squeeze will trim you know, dimensions that are one um so that you no longer have those uh dimensions and you'll see that now our shape is 8 by 128 by 128 by 128 so uh these are blocks so what we want to do is recombine those blocks into a full scan so no brainer implements this and our expected output shape is 256 by 256 by 256 um, so we run this, and now our brain mask is that shape. And we can plot it, and we'll plot it against um, uh, the input volume. So this is the volume we gave, and this is the output. So I mean, it actually, it does look like a brain. It's not great, but it definitely does look like a brain. So, you know, even from that one uh, scan, we have a model. This is not a model, excuse me, that I would ever use uh, really for anything other than like debugging, um, but it works, meaning that it gives output. <laughs> um, and let's look at the dice score. So we can use um, the no-brainer metrics uh, module and uh, it influence uh, dice. So let's run that. And the dice score is uh, 0.87, where one would be perfect overlap. So, you know, actually, not that bad. Um, the caveat to all this is that uh, that model, you know, just please remember that it was only trained on, on a single scan. Um, so it's not going to actually generalize uh, all that well. Um, All right, excellent. So what have we learned so far? Uh, we've learned how to you know, understand your data, how to visualize your features and your labels. Uh, we also learned that training is slow. Uh, in addition, we learned that training can be ridden with errors. So this is common you know, in software development and, and I guess scientific computing, computing in general, 
it's always an iterative process where you run into errors, you figure it out, and then you move on. Um, so please don't get discouraged about that uh, because it, it happens to everyone. Uh, also, the models do not generalize well. So uh, recommendation, and I believe Professor Richards uh, recommended this. Um, if possible, begin with a model that was trained on lots of data. I think exactly what he recommended was um, find lots of data that you can pre-train your model on. But in this case, we have a pre-trained model. This is, uh, what we're going to do here is download the uh, no-brainer uh, model for brain extraction, which is a unit uh, that was trained on uh, blocks of 128 uh, cubed. All right, so now we're going to, I guess, reload that same path that we evaluated on. Uh, Z-score it, and then, did that work? Yes, okay. And now, uh, separated the blocks, expand dims to add the grayscale channel. And now what we do is predict using the pre-trained model. So you can see, you know, here we downloaded uh, this file. It's, it comes from GitHub. I uploaded it there. Uh, we name it with this name. It's an HDF5 file. Uh, and then we load it here uh, with TensorFlow. OK. So now, uh, with our inputs, we can predict. And this is something that you can do on CPU as well. Um, so on, uh, you know, on, on i7 or something like that, this might take, you know, a minute or a few minutes at most. All right, so that's done, one second per step. And now uh, we do the same thing where we threshold. Uh, here I choose 50% or 0.5, uh, squeeze the last dimension, and then uh, reconstruct the full volume. Okay, that happens very quickly. And now we plot it. All right, and this is, you know, a much higher quality uh, brain mask now. And you'll notice that, you know, uh, these scans uh, were not part of the training set. And yet uh, it's doing quite well uh, on these scans to create uh, the, the brain mask. Um, so I think a takeaway from here is that uh, transfer learning or like starting with a pre-trained model can be very powerful, especially if you don't have lots of data. And this is also important. If the model you're starting from was trained on, on similar, uh, similar data. All right. So let's assess, uh, our dice score, assess our performance. And what do you know? It's 0.956. Uh, much higher than the 87 or 88 we got earlier. Um, and also we get much more of the like finer details, um, which is great. And we didn't have to do any training. All right, uh, I wanted to, so it's 117. Uh, I think I'll skip this part now um, because this is basically doing the same thing. This is now downloading the uh, Bayesian model, the, the variational model, uh, and predicting on that. So, you know, for those um, uh, that want to, uh, you know, you can run these cells another time, but in the interest of time, I would like to move on, um, especially because uh, the same, it basically teaches the same lessons that we just got through, how to um, train with a pre-trained model. Oh, sorry, how to predict with a pre-trained model. All right, so now we're at this part here. So we learned a lot and that's great. We learned how to process our data, uh, instantiate a deep neural network architecture, train our model and predict. We even learned how to use a pre-trained model. And this work, uh, works really well for learning the basics uh, and debugging and predicting on a few scans. But importantly, it does not scale. So if you're training on any respectable amount of data, you will not be able to fit it into memory. Um, also, performing augmentation during training uh, can be important, uh, but it's not really clear how we would do that with what we've learned so far. 
Uh, and another thing, uh, we don't want to load and then process and then train. We would much rather load, process, and train in an interleaved fashion so that our GPU and, C and CPU are never idle. In other words, so that our GPU is never like starved for data, so that it's never waiting uh, for data to come in. Uh, and that's especially important if you're using paid cloud services. All right, so um, here's a sort of more detailed workflow uh, of what would happen in the real world. And this is definitely the workflow that I follow. Um, so about 11 minutes left. Uh, and I guess I would like to uh, leave some time for questions in the end. So um, I won't read through all of this, but sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, like, if you end at uh, 30, I'm sure like a guy will give you a couple of more uh, minutes for questions. Okay. Um, the main parts of this workflow are first to prepare your data on disk. So you need to have access to lots of data uh, and you want to have a mapping between features and labels. Uh, so these are paths to corresponding MRI files in this case. Uh, and you want to separate all of your data into uh, three sets, ideally. Uh, you want to have a training set on which you train. You want to have a validation set on which you, know, you can uh, validate your model as you're training it. And finally, you want to have a testing set where after training is done, uh, you can uh, predict on completely unseen data. And you can see how well your model does there. And it's important that your testing set is not seen during training because during training, you're sort of iteratively improving things, improving hyperparameters, and you want to leave your testing set out of that process. Um, third point related to preparing data, uh, TensorFlow has a preferred file format for data and it's called TF record. Uh, and that's, that's the preferred file format for data that does not fit into memory. So, you know, you could use NumPy arrays, but, you know, even if you have like, you know, 100 scans or something, uh, typically you won't be able to fit, fit that onto your RAM. Um, and this format is also great because it allows for parallel reading. Uh, so you can read from multiple files at once. All right, so I think uh, we got through the processing pipeline. Uh, we, we sort of talked about that before choosing a loss function, choosing a model, yes. Uh, you can also create the model yourself with the TF Keras API and then use you know, any of the no-brainer uh, functionality. Uh, finally, training and evaluating. Okay, so this is what a mapping between features and labels might look like. You have a CSV, uh, a spreadsheet, and each row is uh, a pair of features and labels. And the number of rows that you have would be the number of um, scans that you have. OK. So let's do that here. Uh, we'll get that same data. We'll read that CSV, which is the mapping. And then we separate into training, uh, validation, and testing. And here it's, I'm just using simple indexing, but in the real world, you would want to shuffle around and, and, and separate after some, you know, you randomly shuffle um, so that you distribute like different sort of features among all three sets. All right, uh, the next step is uh, verifying that all of these volumes have the same shape and that all the labels are integer-ish. So uh, if they're floats, that you know, they can be converted safely to an integer. Uh, so we do that because, uh, I mean, this is, I guess, a bit of quality control. Um, you don't want volumes that are different shapes because then you can't stack them. OK. And now uh, we convert uh, the volumes to TF records. And TF records is a format that would be on disk that like we're copying the data from the MRI into TF records and then TensorFlow can very quickly read that data and process it. 
So no brainer uh, includes functionality for this. Uh, the TF record format um, initially can be a little bit, I don't know, I might say not daunting, but a little bit confusing. It uses protocol buffers or like a protocol buffer sort of format, uh, I believe. So in any case, no brainer uh, makes it quite easy. So we take our training paths and we take all of those uh, and save them to files uh, with this name. And uh, does nobrainer read, write, make files? So uh, nobrainer uh, uses Nibabel for all of its um, neuroimaging IO. So if Nibabel can read it, then uh, nobrainer uh, can read it. So I think Nibabel can read, make files. So in that case, yes, but it depends on Nibabel in that case. Ah, okay, apparently there are bugs. Okay, uh, that might be good for uh, Nibable, uh an issue or a pull request better. Um, okay, I won't go through the details here in the interest of time, but here we're saving our data to TF record. And uh, this is also uh, useful because so, you know, apparently the, the issues with different neuroimaging file formats uh, and different readers. Once you convert it to TF record, you can share these very freely and you can, you know, upload them to HPC or something like a cloud provider and then uh, run it there without having to worry about IO because TensorFlow uh, is guaranteed to be able to read these things. All right, so the saving is uh, pretty much done. And uh, we saved three files for the training path because we're creating different shards. So we split our different sets into different files so that when we end up reading them, we can read them in parallel and that speeds things up. It also makes the conversion process faster. And you'll see that if you uh, list the contents of the directory, you'll see different files. All right. So this is, I think, also a point where uh, no-brainer shines. Um, you can create a like a, a, an input processing workflow very easily. So uh, there are a few parameters that you'll need to think about: the number of classes, uh, the batch size, which is the number of samples that uh, a model sees at each step. So in this case, batch size of two would mean uh, you're seeing two of those blocks, two blocks per training step. Uh, the shape of the original volume, the shape of blocks that we want to separate into. Um, augmentation, here it's pretty straightforward. It just means if we want to apply random rigid transformations. So uh, rotation, uh, translation, reflection. Uh, the number of epics, meaning the number of times we iterate over the entire data set. Uh, shuffling. Shuffling is very important, by the way. Um, if you don't shuffle, your model might learn the, uh, something about like the order of, of, of input data. So you definitely, you absolutely need to shuffle uh, your training set, that is. And then number of parallel calls and TensorFlow allows you to uh, you know, TensorFlow can sort of figure that out, uh, the number of CPUs to use for things. All right, so this function, uh, lots of parameters that we all set up here. Uh, this will, this is implemented in the, oh, I didn't run this, I'm sorry. So I run that, and then we run this. So this is creating a TensorFlow data set now that loads data, separates it into uh, blocks, uh, creates the correct batch size, applies augmentation if we wanted to, shuffles it, um, and basically prepares it for uh, training. And at, at that point, it's ready for training. So this is our validation data set. You'll notice that we don't shuffle the validation set, and that's our test set. And notice again, we don't shuffle the test set. Oh, and the, it knows where to get the data from because we gave it a certain uh, file pattern. And that's like a, a glob pattern, basically. Next, we want to choose our loss function. Um, and we choose a model. Uh, like I said, many different options. Here, we're just going to load uh, that same brain extraction model 
that we used earlier. Um, uh, we're running out of time, but that's okay because we're almost at the very end. So this is actually working out perfectly. So for transfer learning, um, this might be a bit advanced, but uh, the, the pre-trained model has already learned a lot about the features of, of its own training data. So when you're training this, you want to apply, typically you want to apply some sort of regularization and you want to apply, uh, like I said, typically a relatively low learning rate. And this is something I do so that uh, you don't drastically shift the weights that the model has already learned. It's more like you're sort of fine tuning it to your problem. So you don't, you don't want to like drastically change the weights as if you were training from scratch, you want to more fine tune it. So that is done here. And now we can train. And here we train. It's going to train for five epics. And each epic is 28 steps. And this is uh, you know, the, the algebra that you might do to figure out the number of steps. Uh, you actually don't need to know the number of steps uh, offhand because um, the f during the first epic, uh, the model will go through and uh, cache, I guess, the number of steps that it took in the, in the first epic. Um, so that actually will happen for a little bit. So I'm just going to train this for one epic. That'll be 28 steps. Then we will evaluate it. And that will be it for me. And I can answer questions. I see one question. How many epics do people typically run during training? It varies. Uh, so that brain extraction model was only trained for five epics. But those five epics took, uh, how long did that take to train? Those five epics took more than five days to train, I believe. Um, and that's, a, uh, that's due to, you know, it, it takes time because the data are large and they're three-dimensional. On what data size? Uh, that was 10,000 brain scans. So 10,000 samples separated into eight non-overlapping blocks, so 80,000 blocks in that case. Uh, one thing that I did not demonstrate in this notebook, uh, but if you have access to multiple GPUs, so for example, on HPC, um, you can train with multiple GPUs and you can look at the TensorFlow documentation on how to do that. Uh, another pretty basic question, probably not so basic, don't worry, uh, this model does not examine the spatial relationships of boxes in relation to each other, right? Is there a way to add that as a feature? Great question. Um, so that's an area of research um, that, I, that I'm personally very interested in, how to explain what these models are doing. How do we improve you know, our own understanding of these models? Because at the moment, they're more or less black boxes. So, um, but to answer your question, uh, it, yes, it does examine the spatial relationships of voxels. And that's done uh, through the convolutional layers. Uh, so it has like, it understands the spatial relationships of, of fairly local, uh, like voxels in a fairly local region. Um, but typically I, I have not seen uh, people separate out those features manually. I, I would expect the model to learn those things on its own. So we are going to let uh, that run, uh, Jacob. Uh, yeah. Is there any other questions? Like uh, I think I, I think I saw like a epoch uh, epoch versus a batch uh, clarification somewhere, but. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, that's a great. Point. Um, so uh, let me start by saying that sample is uh, like one instance. So a sample in our case here would be one block, uh, one sub block from the volume. Uh, so you have eight samples per volume. Uh, so you have one, uh, that's a sample. A batch is how many samples you're feeding to the network at one time. And then an epic 
is one pass through your entire data set. So after you go through your entire data set once, that's an epic. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so if, are there any other questions while uh, we're met, waiting for yeah, this? This should be done in a few seconds. There was one question, do you think that would be a useful thing to try or too computationally expensive? Uh, you know, if, if, if you want to try it, by all means, go right ahead. Um, it might work, it might not. But uh, I think the best way to know is to actually try it. Um, it might be computationally expensive, but I don't think that's a reason to, to stop. Um, because, you know, you might find that it's, it's not computationally expensive. I hope that answers it. All right, so this is done just about. All I wanted to show was the training, uh, the, the output, like the history basically from training and then evaluate. And I wanted to show you guys that um, basically transfer learned model uh, can work in many cases. So here is, oh, that's weird. Oh, because there's only one epic, that's why. Okay, uh, so sorry, uh, because before I had a training for five epics, but that would take too long. Anyway, here we'll evaluate, and you'll see that the dice is quite good. So yeah, it's 9538, or 9437. Okay. Yeah. Jakob, that was excellent. Thanks so much, indeed. Uh, we're really, really grateful, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fun and interesting work uh, that you've done. Uh, and also, uh, I would now to like reemphasize that uh, you know all the work that has been done to make that available for for us and for everyone uh, is uh, is really awesome. Uh, so uh, so congrats, thanks thanks again. Uh, we really appreciate. And uh, and I don't know if you're going to stay online for the rest of the afternoon or not. Probably not. But if you do, like uh, I'm sure there will be other questions if you uh, if you are. If not, okay. you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like we can forward your questions. Absolutely, yeah. Or connect on GitHub or, or Gmail or anything. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so no, much. Thank, thanks. Thank you.